going to be talking about um, NumPy 2.0. Um, recently, I spent some time on string view funks and uh, doing string operations on NumPy much, much faster than what was being done before. My name is Lisandros. Uh, this is EuroPython 2024. We're in Prague, and it's the 10th of July 2024. Um, most of my time I spend on Python stuff. I work for uh, Quantsite Labs, I, I'm a C Python core dev, I work on NumPy a bit, and I also co-organize Pi Greece and Pi Berlin, which are two meetups, <coughs> one in Greece in Athens and one in Berlin where I live. Uh, so NumPy 2.0, it was released uh, about a month ago. Um, lots and lots of exciting stuff in it. Uh, changes and improvements in the C API, the Python API, docs improvements, everything got reworked. Yes, with it came uh, deprecations, came removals as well that might break code, but it's it's an awesome it's an awesome development. And actually, it came out about 18 years after NumPy one, so NumPy one is now old enough to drink. Um, and yeah, it was it was time for for 2.0. One of the things that came out in 2.0 was fast string operations, and this is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, um, yes, so uh, fast string operations, it began as a project um, by looking at this. And, and this is C code, but it's very, very easy what it does. Basically, it's how string operations used to work before NumPy. What it uh, was doing is the, the first line there, it gets um, the, um, the string method, the Python string method that is, no C function there, it just gets uh, a Python function. Um, then it converts the, num the, um, the NumPy array item to a Py object, that's a, an, an internal structure we have in C Python then calls that Python function with that Py object and then does the conversion back uh, to a NumPy array item. So that means, and as you may imagine, this is very, very inefficient. Uh, for every item in an array, if an array is 10,000 items long, then for, every, for, for all the 10,000 of those items, um, we need to do this. Uh, so to recap, we, we have to convert the C data buffer to a Python object. We need to call a Python function with a Python object, and then the resulting um, object needs to be converted back to our presentation that NumPy can understand. Um, so the idea was, okay, why do we have to do this? Let's just do it all with the raw data buffer that we have in C. And so our talk today is going to be about the journey of converting all of that to working with a raw data buffer. Um, uh, in doing that, we first need to examine what NumPy's ND array is. Um, an ND array, if we have this array, for example, that's a, um, um, an, a, a NumPy array. Um, what that is, if we assume that it's an int64 array. We have a, a, a C data buffer up top, um, and then we have some information about the data buffer and how to interpret that. NumPy keeps all sort of information like um, endiness of the operating system or whether it's a C or a Fortran contiguous array. That means whether it's row major, or column major, the, the way that it's stored in memory. But the most basic of information is this. What What's the element's um, size? For example, in an N64 array, it's eight. What are the dimensions, or better expressed, how many dimensions do we have? Here we have rows and columns, that's two dimensions. The shape, um, that's two uh, comma three. And the strides, the, stride, um, the strides is a very, very interesting um, uh, to, um, mechanism to, to describe how can I go to the next element. Because remember, we have a data buffer that's just a sequence of bytes. It doesn't have any information about what, how, how many bytes do I need to jump in order to go to the next element. 
So the strides is uh, basically a tuple that says that in order uh, that it's as big as the number of dimensions and the 24 represents the number of bytes I need to jump in order to go to the next element in the first dimension. Um, the eight is um, how many L uh, bytes do I need to jump in, uh, forward in order to go to the next element in the second dimension. Um, because this is a two, a two by three array, um, three times eight is 24, and that means I need to jump 24 bytes um, in order to go to the, to the first element in the second row, basically. If it's an in32, it's basically the exact, exact same thing, only the information changes. The data buffer only changes very, very slightly. It's just the information on how to interpret that data buffer that changes. Um, so yeah, with that, we need to ask ourselves, okay, if, if it's only the information that changes, then what happens with arrays, right? Uh, with strings, I might. Um, is it, is the, the memory layout like this, where we have like high prog exclamation point all in, um, in a contigu contiguous part of memory? Um, and if so, what's the item size? Uh, remember that the item size is static, it's not dynamic, so we, we can say the uh, different items have different sizes. It needs to be one number for an array, right? So what NumPy does is something like this. Um, it appends zero bytes to the end of the, um, of the items that are smaller than the biggest one, and then sets the, the biggest items um, uh, size to the size of the array itself. So for example, for this array, because prac is six characters long, and obviously here we assume that this is a byte array, so each character is just one byte. Because prac is six characters long, the, the basic size is six bytes, the dimensions, the number of dimensions is one, the shape is three, and the strides is six. Um, and so uh, we have those zero bytes, and that's why There you go, oops. That's why we call these, these D types fixed with string D types. The fixed comes from, that, uh, from the fact that all of the array items have the same size and zero bytes are just appended to the end so that we can keep that uh, same size. So do you remember the problem from before? We said let's do it all in C. So what we can do is basically just this. Call a C function operating on the C buffer. And the question that arises is does NumPy have a mechanism for that? And the answer to that is yes. NumPy has um, a mechanism called ufunks, which is just that. You can create a C function that operates on the data buffer of the um, uh, of the array, um, and in order to do that, you have to do some things. Um, the documentation of NumPy includes this quote, it's too much theory and not, uh, not enough information about how to actually use it, so I just put it there for completeness, but let's just see how to use it. In order to do a ufunc, you have to write one function that's called, um, uh, that's called whatever you want it to call it, but it takes four arguments. The, ar the args, the dimensions, the steps, and the data. Um, and NumPy itself calls these functions and, and provides all of the arguments. So um, you just need to write this and register it, and that's all. And, and the arguments here, args is an array of pointers to the data buffer so if you have let's say a ufunc that operates on two arguments then args will give you pointers to the data buffers of the two arguments and it'll give you a pointer to the data buffer of the output right uh, dimensions is a pointer to the dimensions steps is those strides we talked about uh, that tell you how how many bytes do i need to jump in order to go to the next element and then data is irrelevant um, so when we started doing this, we, uh, we chose this alpha as the first thing to do because this alpha is the easiest thing to do, so I just wanted something very, very easy. And this is what that ufunc looked like for is alpha. Uh, we have is alpha takes just one argument and pr produces one output. So we, we get 
the data buffers for in and out. We, we get the number of dimensions, which is the number of steps we need to do. Uh, we, we take in, which is the data buffer. We pass that to a string is alpha function. They'll do the right thing. No need to care about this here. And then um, this returns a bool. We cast the out, uh, the out data buffer to, uh, to a bool star and then write to that the result. And then the steps basically give us the number of bytes we need to jump. And remember how I told you that in, uh, the data buffers are just sequence of bytes? That si that's signified here by in and out both being just car stars. They don't have information about whether they're storing ints or whatever it is. We do that all by casting to the appropriate type. Um, and and uh, this is how to write a ufunc. It's very, very easy. It's just a one-dimensional loop. But, and you just jump forward to go to the next element. Um, so the next function was add. And add is a bit more complex in that it also returns a string. Remember, is alpha returned um, a Boolean. So Booleans are really easy to return because it's a static thing. We know that a Boolean is basically one byte in NumPy, so we can cast to a bool, and that was it. But if you tried to do the same thing and just write a one-dimensional loop for add, you, you would get this error, and you don't need to read it all. It just says that you need to provide a resolve descript descriptors function. Um, what is that? Uh, the output descriptors are basically information about what the ufunc returns. Remember how we said that um, that strings are parametric in that the, the element size can change. If the string is six characters long, then the item size is six. If it's more than that, then it can be 10 or 15 or whatever it is, right? Uh, but when you are defining a ufunc and you need to return a string, you need to tell NumPy how big, how big of a string do I return from this. And the, the way to do that is with um, this resolve descriptors function which uh, basically the two arguments uh, that are important here is given descriptors and loop descriptors. Given is what the descriptors are right now and loop descriptors is something you have to write to and say these are the descript descriptors that I want to have um, in the ufunc. And, and if you check this, uh, uh, you'll see that the np.add result does a Unicode 6. So that means that the first string is ABC, three characters long. The second one is DEF, three characters long as well. Um, and then the resulting string is six characters long. So we need basically to add the lengths of the two um, buffers. And in order to do that, this is how we do that. Uh, this is really not important. It just says use whatever you have now. For, um, for the two input descriptors. And for the output descriptor, we can just, um, you'll see that the, the important line is where we increment L size by the, the, the um, L size of the second element. So what that does is basically says uh, that the, the output arrays uh, length will be the input arrays length sum. Um, and with that, add worked, and then we had to go to the next functions. And um, the next functions were find and R find. Uh, for find and R find, there was nothing really new, um, but there was one thing that was kind of tricky, and that was that um, find takes actually a start and an end uh, index you, uh, that you want to search in. So you can use find with just strings, but you can just pass two integers there and say, I want to search between the, the first and the fourth index or something like that. And um, if you uh, uh, remember that ufunks operate on specific uh, data types, so we write a ufunk to operate, let's say, on in 64s but we don't really want to operate to write a ufunk for in 32, in 16, in 8, and, and all of these other data types. But if we were to pass Python ints or some other data type other than the loop we've written, then we get this, that 
basically we don't have implemented a loop uh, that will operate on the correct data types. And in order to circumvent that, there is something called a promoter. And the promoter is, is basically information about how to uh, promote certain data types to other data types. Let's say someone passes in an int8 array um, to a ufunc, we want to cast that to an int64 and then call the loop that's, that implements the int64 um, ufunc. Um, and to do that, uh, promoter gives us, uh, again, two arguments that are important, OPD types and new OPD types. Similar to what we saw before, OPD types are the, the D types that the user passes, new OPD types is, the, uh, is something we need to write to and say, okay, cast these data types that you took to these other data types I have implemented a loop for, and NumPy will do the right thing, cast, and then call the correct loop for it. Um, and the, the way to do this is basically here we say, okay, whatever data type you took, just use that, so no casting occurs. And, and here we basically say very, very strictly for the third and the fourth argument, uh, the data type needs to be an NPy int64, and that's an int64 data type. And, and so NumPy will, will try to cast whatever it has to an int64 before calling the, the ufunc. For the output, um, it's not really important here, but you can set it to something else as well. Um, so after installing the promoter, we can uh, pass um, int 8, int 16, int, um, int 32, whatever ints we might have, we can pass to find, and it'll do the correct thing. It'll cast to 64, and then what, because we've implemented a 64-bit uh, loop, uh, this is what will be called. Um, so the last thing I'm going to be presenting today is replace because replace has many, many challenges. Uh, the main challenge is that remember how in add we, we had the size and we knew about the size uh, up front. We knew it's going, if we're adding a three, uh, a three character um, string and a, th and a four character string, it would be seven characters long. When we're doing replace, we don't really know how many replacements we'll do or stuff like that. And, and so the problem is that the output size is not, is not known up front and, and thus we, we really can't uh, implement that result descriptors function that we saw before. Um, and in order to circumvent that, we came up with uh, this solution. This is a Python wrapper, no need to read this. But basically what it does it, um, it is that it counts the number of occurrences of the thing that we want to replace. And, um, it, um, and then it computes uh, the difference in characters between what we're replacing uh, and what we're substituting in. And, and, then, and then basically takes um, uh, and allocates enough space for all of those things to, f um, to, um, to fit in memory. And then if you see here, it calls um, the loop with an out keyword argument and the out keyword argument is you don't need to figure out, uh, uh, um, you don't need to allocate memory to, um, to store the output of the ufunc I'll give you the, the memory where you need to, um, to store this. And, and we need to slightly change the result descriptors func to say, if you've not given me an out, then I'm gonna raise an exception because we necessarily need um, the, the memory that, um, where we're going to be storing things. And if we don't have that, then we can do it. So um, this was replace. It wasn't that hard, but we needed a Python wrapper for that. And you'll see here that if we call the ufunc with, without the out, then it, it raises a value error and says the out should be given. And if we call it with the out, then um, it does the correct thing. Um, the Python wrapper is in a new namespace called np.strings and that's what you w should always be uh, using because you don't need to pass out or whatever else. It basically does everything automatically but, uh, but has a tiny bit of Python in front of the, all of the C stuff.
not about for uh, about the results was it any faster after all and um, the answer to that is yes it was much much faster uh, for, for example add was the one that uh, had the most significant speed up it it was about two orders of magnitude faster um, in case you can read it that's four 192 times faster, that's not 4.92, that's actually 492 times faster. Um, and, and yeah, for, for, uh, and that's only for a thousand element array, for even bigger arrays it will be even, even, even more of a speed up. And that's that overhead of um, having to create Python objects back and forth and calling Python functions, no need to do all that, just operate on the, on the raw data buffer. So yeah, the, the speed up was amazing. And, and even for the most basic of functions like ease alpha, we had speed ups upwards of 100x for, for relatively small arrays like thousand element arrays. Um, but that's not all. Um, NumPy 2.0 has another very, very um, nice update and that's variable with string D types. You can imagine that if you have like uh, arrays with thousands of elements and you have fixed width um, elements, then that means you're wasting bytes, adding zeros all over the place. And that's me not memory efficient, not at all. And um, while all of this was brewing, um, a colleague of mine was working on variable uh, width string D types. And what this does is basically gets rid of all of those zero bytes um, and you can have um, string arrays where the, the underlying buffer only really has the, um, the data that you have in the array and no zero bytes, nothing like that. Um, there are some caveats to that. So if you want to read about it, I think the, uh, the NEP the NumPy enhancement proposal is 55, not 55, if you want to read more about that. Um, so yeah, that's it on my side. Um, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. So um, we have five minutes for questions. I think we can take about two or three questions. Okay. Um, one thing I'm wondering is, as you're writing these um, UFUNCs with complex casting and buffers and stuff like that, how do you test your code to make sure that there's no possible like er complex error cases created? Um, we're testing extensively with um, uh, with just um, having pipe. Uh, unit tests for all the Python wrappers. So for, for every UFUNG we write, we basically have a Python wrapper um, um, that does things like default arguments and stuff like that. Um, and then we call that, we have unit tests for those, for those Python wrappers. Uh, it, it, that's not to say that there's no bugs. There, there is bugs. Uh, in, in fact, this morning there was a, a bug report about strip not doing the right thing now in NumPy. Uh, that's been fixed though. And yeah, we, I mean, there's always going to be bugs. We'll fix them. And um, I don't think there'll be, I don't think there'll be too many. So uh, if, if you don't mind, I, I wasn't accusing you of writing bugs. I was more saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. what advice would you give me so that I can stop writing bugs? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, the approach, uh, in the NumPy code base is to just write as many tests as possible, uh, trying to, to catch as many edge cases as possible, and then hope for the best, I guess. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Uh, probably, if you, I knew more about NumPy, I'd probably already know the answer to this. Um, encoding, so it, all the examples are ASCII. Uh, the links fixed byte sizes or presumably must be rather than characters. Is it UTF-8 internally or what? Um, so fixed, uh, fixed with D types are only uh, bytes or, um, or Unicode, but that's UTF-32. And all of that was for both uh, of those D types. The new string D type has support for UTF-8 as well. Um, 
I know that Polars, prior to their 1.0 release, did a big internal rewrite of how they handle strings, um, mainly for, for performance. Are there similarities between what they're doing and what you're doing, or are the, are the two tools just aiming for different things? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get what project you were talking about. Um, Polars, sort of oh, one uh, of the replacements for Pandas. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about, um, about the string D type because I think that Pandas has had a D type for variable with strings for a long time now, and Polars might have adopted some of that functionality. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can say much more than that. Sure, I, I think Polis have diverged to a new implementation, German style string implementation. I don't know all the full details, but in a bit of a speed, but maybe once take offline. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.